Welcome back everyone to the final panel of the JSAL Future of SOF Forum. Recall that we are exploring the SOF identity through the four lenses of SOF utility, SOF ethics, SOF technology, and now diversity and inclusion. I will now turn the floor over to our JSAL Director of Research, Dr. Chris Marsh, who will introduce his fascinating panel and lead them in understanding the intersection between soft organizational culture and its impact on diversity and inclusion. Dr. Marsh, it's, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Joe, I appreciate that. Um, yes, I am joined today by three very accomplished individuals who are quite impressive, and I think we're gonna have an interesting discussion. So uh, with me is Captain Shea Haver from the Military District of Washington, the Old Guard, Colonel Candace Pipes from SOCOM's J-1, and Dr. Susan Harmeling from the University of Southern California. We're gonna, we're gonna begin by give, handing it over to Captain Shea Haver and let her talk about her experiences, her accomplishments, and her background. And you will find that it's very impressive. Captain Haver, the floor is all yours. Hey, thank you, Chris, and thanks um, to the panel in general for making it here today. Uh, I think we'll, we will in, indeed have a really uh, interesting conversation. So uh, I think they wanted to kind of open up today with, with starting with a little bit of the tactical um, piece and kind of the, the um, floor up, if you will. Um, so I'll just kind of say what my background has been, uh, and the Amazing Ladies Afternoon will be able to kind of describe what they, how they uh, are going to contribute to the conversation as well. So. Um, in 2015, I had an opportunity as part of a group of 19 women to go to um, Ranger School in April 2015. Um, during that experience, I got to uh, go through as um, that co cohort together, um, ended up recycling multiple times, obviously, and in the end, um, ended up graduating as one of two uh, female, in, uh, female in the first class of Ranger School. Uh, to graduate females. Um, I ended up going back to my unit after that as an aviation officer um, and had the full intentions of staying and, and doing that um, and had a sh an opportunity shortly after that to go to the Maneuver Captain's Career Course, which was just the next thing in my, uh, my pipeline as a junior officer. Uh, while I was there, uh, I did make the decision to voluntary transfer into the infantry. Uh, and then with Kristen Grice being uh, one of the first uh, captains at that time, uh, to voluntary transfer. During that time period, there were only two posts that were open up as we were um, trying to um, integrate women into combat arms. It was either Fort Hood or going to Fort Bragg. Uh, I was um, lucky enough to go um, by choice to the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, where I grew up as an infantry officer, um, first on a brigade staff, uh, and then a battalion staff, and then on to uh, take my first um, infantry rifle company there. Um, following that, uh, I took an HHC and was the first uh, female infantry uh, commander uh, to command in a combat in, uh, in Afghanistan in 2019, um, which leads me to my uh, current job now uh, at the Old Guard, where I'm a Memorial Affairs Company commander uh, and the first female uh, infantry commander in this unit as well. Outstanding. Very impressive, of course. Thank you for that. Uh, Colonel Pipes, would you like to talk to us for a few minutes? Sure, thanks. Uh, greetings all. I'm, I'm honored and grateful to, to be here today with these two accomplished women on this panel and also grateful to the Joint Special Operations University for dedicating this afternoon to focus on diversity and inclusion issues uh, with respect to special operations. Um, I'm currently serving as the Chief of Manpower and Personnel Division here in Headquarters SOCOM in the J-1, but for the last nine months, I've also been leading the SOCOM diversity and inclusion effort. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the work that we've done in the last nine months that I think will set the stage uh, for further conversation here as we get into what about organizational culture can hinder or facilitate uh, positive change in, in diversity and inclusion. So uh, as was mentioned in, in the previous session, in, in 1999, Rand did a study looking at barriers to representation in SOF and forced the SOF world to really confront the lack of diversity in its ranks while also providing some considerations for uh, what might be both internal and external considerations um, and recommendations on how to more intentionally remove barriers to representation in special operations career fields. So fast forward 20 plus years, 
Uh, and we recognize that SOCOM and the soft enterprise did not do enough with that information at the time. Um, as is typical with diversity and inclusion in, in many organizations, the concerns and responses to those kinds of study were sidelined once a significant operational uh, uh, event overwhelmed the force. And in this case, it was 9-11. It was so we, we recognize this again over the summer with the tragic death of George Floyd, uh, which caused a resurgence in DNI efforts uh, DOD wide. And we knew that we needed to do three things in the near term. The first is we needed to understand who we are now, 20 years after that initial RAND study. The second was we needed to create permanent DNI infrastructure to ensure that the, our DNI efforts are sustained over the course of time and independent of any significant operational challenges we might face. And then third, we quickly realized that we also needed to divorce DNI from the narrative that equates diversity with lowered standards um, and to bridge the gap um, in the narrative that separates diversity and inclusion from operational needs to in fact demonstrate how DNI is in fact DNI are in fact operational imperatives. So who are we? Uh, we are a more diverse force than we were 20 years ago and have been successful integrating women into most of our soft mission sets as Captain Haver is a testament to. But we, when we correct for those career fields that were looked at uh, during that 1999 RAND study, um, Rangers, SF, SEALs, and Air Force combat controllers and PJs were really not that different in terms of racial and ethnic diversity and in some cases even less represent representative. So what are we doing about it? We're building the permanent DNI infrastructure to conduct barrier analysis, intentionally plan how to better attract diverse talent, and work to create more inclusive, uh, inclusive environments where diversity is not just welcome, but allowed to exist in its truest form so that all members are, uh, uh, are able to participate fully in the organization. We published SOCOM's first diversity and inclusion strategic plan, which outlines four lines of effort. The first is organizational climate and culture. Second, soft integration. Third, education training, uh, education and training, and then the fourth, sustainment. We've also hired a chief diversity and inclusion officer that, that just arrived uh, this month and is still getting uh, um, his sea legs under him. Um, and he will use this strategy to work with our service component teams to build on the enterprise's momentum to codify diversity and inclusion um, as operational imperatives within, with the goal of fostering more capable, adaptive, and lethal force um, that is increasingly more representative of the republic that we serve. Finally, we've created a, a special operations executive committee that's co-chaired uh, by the SOCOM vice commander and a ASD Solik um, to have senior executive level conversations uh, regarding all of these things. Why are we doing all of this? because diversity and inclusion are operational imperatives, and we know this at our core. We know we need soft with unique training, language skills, and ways of solving problems. So increasing the racial, ethnic, and gender diversity of soft will only increase our ability to solve problems, to engage in diverse global environments, and encourage a more cross-culturally competent force. Uh, so I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. That was very interesting. And we are making progress, it sounds like. So that's a good thing. Um, Dr. Harmeling, what's the perspective like from your, your vantage point? First of all, I'd like to also thank you so much for having me today. I'm awed and, and somewhat almost intimidated by the, the incredible accomplishments of the two other uh, panelists here and really looking forward to our conversation. So I have had a long career in academia and consulting after graduating way too long ago uh, from Harvard Business School with an MBA. And I was uh, going along my merry way doing uh, consulting work and, um, and uh, some sort of academic consulting work when after an incredible experience working in Croatia of all places in the after the Balkan Wars, um, their society, their economy, um, and their lives had been devastated. I was asked to do a consulting job over there in an entrepreneurship program. And that really changed my life because I saw how it changed their lives. And I saw how entrepreneurship um, has the ability to transform, um, transform people and transform their lives with a new way of thinking. So after working in that program, I decided to go and pursue a PhD at the University of Virginia 
Uh, I had two little kids and I, I commuted three hours each way for years to get my um, PhD um, at the University of Virginia in ethics and entrepreneurship. And as a result of that uh, study, I started to get really, really um, extremely interested in business ethics and ethics in general. It was a program that was very deep in philosophy. We studied Kant and Plato and the modern pragmatists and had a real grounding in you know, ethical philosophy. And I then uh, took a job at Howard University in Washington, DC, where my ethics, ethics and entrepreneurship training started to sort of turn toward um, a tremendous interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in that environment, I was the only white female teaching um, in this um, at, at, at Howard at that time. And I taught there for 11 years and I had tenure at Howard. I'm, I'm now at the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business and um, have continued my work in entrepreneurship and ethics there. And just one last thing to, to bring up is that, um, and uh, Colonel Pipes brought up the murder of George Floyd. Last June, right in the wake of George Floyd's murder, um, my niece, who was running her 10th reunion class at Harvard Business School, asked me to see if I could come up with something really interesting to talk to her um, classmates about because they were a little disappointed in the lack of um, addressing of some of the issues that were, that were going on um, with regard to the COVID crisis, with regard to George Floyd's murder, um, climate change, and some of the other really big issues. So I did a talk on race relations with my now colleague who, run, who works in race relations in post-apartheid South Africa. And we did a talk there. Um, we just, just talked between ourselves and had a discussion of how his work um, in race relations in South Africa could be relevant, could possibly be relevant to what's going on here in the United States. And what we found was the incredible interest of the audience, their questions were very moving, very raw, um, very honest um, from, from all genders, all races, all ages who are participating in that forum. And um, well, less so all ages, because this was mostly 10th reunion uh, class participants, but definitely a wide range of perspectives. And after that, for the last eight or nine months, we've become utterly immersed in DEI, what's out there, who's doing what, what works and what doesn't. And in different organizations, the, uh, in different organizations, sort of uh, how to look at this issue, how to think about truly, truly recognizing the voices of everyone and the unique contribution that they have to bring, like my two other panelists are bringing to their work today in the military. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion. I hope we get some of the same kinds of provocative and interesting questions today. And, um, and just I can't wait to, to see what the next hour brings. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, the question we have before us is how might organizational culture hinder or facilitate efforts to promote diversity and inclusion? This is really two questions. So let's start out with the first one. How might organizational culture hinder efforts to promote diversity and inclusion? Which one of you would like to go first? Yes, I'll, I'll start a little bit just talking about my experience okay, and maybe I have a a question that will kind of help maybe the panel um, get moving. So um, with the idea of the organizational culture, um, what my experience has been is the environment that I walk into each and every time um, has 100% the ability to change. And I think that that is not necessarily, you know, just from some someone different. It's just from someone new joining an organization. There's, you know, leader uh, or not, when you join an organization, there's a trial period, right, where people are trying to figure out who you are, uh, what your values are, you know, what what group or inclusion you're going to have in, in what in what place. Um, as a leader, I have to walk in not only to that role, hey, hey, am I going to be accepted by this environment, but also are you going to follow me where I'm going to lead you, just by the very nation, nature of my position. So when it comes to um, just walking into that environment um, from the position now, hey, I've, I've raised my right hand and volunteered just like you uh, to A, go through, you know, ranger school or B, you know, now walk into a leadership role in the infantry environment where um, is, it's something new for me, but it's not new for you. Um, how, you know, I, the experience that I have uh, now turns into their experience too. So they get to share that experience with me and start making their own judgments 
Um, and that can only be done like by the experience itself. So when we're talking about like changing an organizational culture, um, and ma'am, Colonel, Colonel Pipes, you brought this up, um, one of the ways um, th through education and training. So not every unit is going to get um, a woman um, or, you know, a, a diverse um, religion, you know, in, in whatever way uh, embedded in them. We don't have the ability because we don't have enough people, right, to, to plug these in. So uh, maybe part of the conversation is how are we preparing or what is the plan to prepare policy-wise um, for people like me, for someone who has a different religion or background to walk into these organizations for them to um, potentially already be a little bit primed um, and ready. And maybe that does come from um, what you mentioned about the, the education uh, and training. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll step in next. I think that's a great segue because I, I think, you know, knowing is half the battle to, to go back to a G.I. Joe, you know, <laughs> quote from from back in the day. Um, so I think recognizing some of these hindrances to uh, the, the, the kind of positive effects of, of promoting a diversity and inclusion effort is, is, is getting us halfway there. And so what, when I think about a few hindrances that I have observed um, in, in my 20 something years of working DNI issues, one is resistance and this can be passive uh, or aggressive, right? <laughs> uh, in terms of the resistance that we might encounter. And so, you know, a passive uh, re uh, uh, resistance might be a, a just kind of refusal to engage on the issue, right? A more aggressive um, uh, effort would be to ignore or even spin um, data or narratives in a way that is counterproductive to the effort, right? And so I think any of those kinds of resistances, whether they are passive or aggressive, can hinder diversity and inclusion efforts um, in an organization. I think another thing uh, that, that we can easily get caught up in as an organization is being satisfied with early wins. Right, um, and so DNI efforts often require a wholesale organizational culture change, which we all know is extremely hard. And, and Captain Harry, you were talking about how hard that is at a at a, at a tactical you kind of team room or or, or um, company room level, right? But if you if you then extend that to the whole organization, it it, it just kind of um, uh, multiplies. So it's it's understandable that in a dynamic in an organization that is task saturated, how there might be a tendency to kind of live on those early wins. Um, oh, we got you know our first two women through Ranger School. Check that box. We're good. We're good to go. And then and then kind of you know squirrel move on to the next uh, the the next issue there. And we have to be uh, maintain focus and be dedicated in a sustained effort to keep moving forward, um, uh, leveraging those early wins, but not being satisfied and kind of living in those early wins. Um, and then, you know, finally, what I'll say as, as a third point is that unchecked narratives, systems, or processes that reflect bias um, are going to hinder DNI efforts. Um, and so I, I mentioned before that this this narrative of, of equating uh, diversity with lowered standards is is one of those. Um, but I was asked as part of doing the strategic plan if I thought that our um, processes and and systems had bias. And I said yes. If if a, if a process or a system has not uh, been intentionally designed in order to mitigate bias, then I believe it has bias, right? And so so we need to kind of go into um, uh, our, our close look at all of our processes and systems, you know, pipelines and, and, and all of these with that, I think, in mind in, in order to help um, better facilitate our DNI efforts. And, and I'll turn it over to, to Dr. Hamling uh, to, to add to that. So one thing that's interesting hearing you, you both talk, in, in particular what you just said, Colonel Pipes, about the uh, early wins, if you bring that up and look at the societal level, you know, people say racism is over or, you know, sexism is over. We're all, it's an equal society now. And yet so many of the recent things that we see in the news with our own eyes and, you know, read with our own eyes and hear with our own ears, you know, go against that. So that's, so as a society, just like in the military or just like in any organization, you can't rely on early wins. You have to keep going and you have to keep working. So that's for sure. Um, when you talk about, um, sort of the, the approach um, and the resistance. I love the passive and active resistance. So I've watched with my own eyes, people get up and leave, you know, diversity trainings in, in a, you know, really upset for various reasons and on in various, you know, various types of um, individuals because they are, you know, you know offended by them, um, feel attacked. Uh, and then what happens is people go even more firmly into their own camps. And what we found 
is that, for example, when you're discussing these issues, uh, there's a there's a, an approach out there that's called an awareness based approach that really doesn't work so well because it's essentially lecturing to people about in in a in a, in a somewhat, I would say, accusatory or blaming way about their biases or about their sensitivities. And those kinds of um, approaches tend not to work as well as a narrative approach and trying to get the narratives right by sharing them and understanding each other's point of view. And it's harder work than just clicking through PowerPoint slides and telling people what their biases are and, and, uh, and you know, saying that everyone, everyone harbors biases. Those things may all be true, but it doesn't work as well as a real examination of our own narrative and the narratives of others and a continuous work toward that. And the final thing that I'll say that I brought up when we were having our informal discussion the other day is what do we need to feel like at work, um, wh whatever organization we're in. We, the, there's a wonderful, um, a wonderful model by Frances Fry at uh, Harvard Business School, and I definitely want to credit her with this. And it's, it always sticks in my mind because it's so elegant and describes um, how we need to feel at work to be at our best. And she goes, she has a dial, it's very simple. It goes from safe to welcome to consulted, I believe it's to consulted to cherished. And the idea is we all have to feel safe at our, at our workplaces. And then we certainly would like to feel welcome. And everyone wants to be consulted on what they believe about particular situations or scenarios. But the, the real, um, you know, the real promise land, if you will, is for everyone to feel cherished for their diversity and for the unique voice they bring and for the innovative, um, creative ways they can look at problems. And how can you have a diverse look at problems and a diverse way to, to uh, go about fixing them and solving them if you don't have a diverse workforce? So I think that I think that the work is still there to be done, both in these in your organization and all organizations and in society at large. And our goal is to lift everyone up to their full potential by cherishing them for their uniqueness, not in spite of their uniqueness. Thank you for that. That's a great transition for us. Um, because I'm going to ask the, the next question, which is how might organizational culture enable efforts to promote diversity and inclusion? And, and with the Francis Fry model, it sounds like you've kind of gotten us going down that lane, Dr. Harmelang. Um, but would who would like to jump in on that one? Or well, I, I kind of I love what uh, Dr. Harmeling brought up about, um, you know, end up getting to the point of cherishing someone. But what that means is you have to actually have a relationship with them. You can't have a relationship with someone unless you have conversations. And kind of what I was get, you know, getting at, especially in my position right now, a lot of the, the formations that I encounter haven't had to have these conversations yet. So they're new. Um, these are the first times I'm having these conversations. So it's new and, and I don't know the right ways to do it either. So we're kind of all learning at the, at the same speed. But I think that the point is that you have to have a, a, at least a, a trust in the organization that you can have these conversations. The conversation just recently that I had to have with uh, the leaders in my chain of command was about, um, you know, um, dignity and respect as it relates to diversity and inclusion. Uh, and, and the first answer, first question that I posed, you know, to my team leaders and squad leaders, uh, platoon sergeants, uh, and, and everywhere in between there. Um, was do we respect people more for being themselves or do we respect people for pretending to be somebody else? And, and unanimously, they were like, of course, we respect people for being themselves. And I was like, okay, so, so you literally respect uh, you know, every person that you come into contact with. No, okay, well, what does that take? It takes building a relationship, building that trust and asking questions. Uh, if you have, and, and then we you know, kind of transitioned into the diversity and inclusion piece for uh, including, so how do you include, how do you invite somebody into your group? And I, I know these sound like very like um, kind of middle school drama type conversations, but uh, it, it's, it's the conversations that no, you know, that nobody has had with them yet. I, ha I necessarily haven't had that conversation yet. And so we talked about our culture, our organizational culture. What does it take to be part of our team? What are the things that our team values? And, you know, can, can what anybody looks like, can, can somebody look different and still have those values? Can someone, you know, talk different, think different and still have those values? 
you know, uh, resoundedly, yes, because we all believe we all belong to this profession, right? Our organizational culture is a shit, you know, is, is a profession. The military is a profession and our organizations that, you know, Dr. Harmeling works with, it's a profession. So we have values. Um, and, and I think, so in order to get to that cherish that Dr. Harmeling was talking about, my, my experience is, is that we have to build the relationships, which takes some vulnerability and the right conversations. Um, and there's not always going to be a diverse person to lead that conversation. Sometimes it's got to be um, the, the majority that still is understanding of the minority's perspective or brings those people in to have those conversations, but there's got to be conversation. Thank you for that. As someone who's not diverse, the, the white guy, white male guy you know, over here, I appreciate that. But um, I'm very open to having the, these discussions and want to learn more. And uh, I think that's why I was chosen to, to help lead this discussion today. Um, Dr. Harmeling, did you want to jump back in or Colonel Pipes, did you want to? Yeah, I think that it's important, um, this idea of, if you're, particularly when, um, as, as uh, Captain Haver has talked about, you know, there aren't very many people, you're going to have to have a, what we call, you know, in the vernacular allies, and you're going to have to have, have, you know, white males uh, who are in, in, in leadership positions wanting and really being committed to um, to advancing, you know, advancing diversity, advancing equality, um, you know, or it's it's not really going to happen. And I want to speak to this being your real self and vulnerability in relationships because it's a huge part of this topic. If we can't understand each other and understand each other for our common humanity and our common um, you know, common experiences in life that go across genders, across races, et cetera, you know, we're not going to get anywhere near as far as we would if we were to do that. And vulnerability has to be rewarded. In other words, you, you've got to be in a safe place. And, and that may sound jargony to some people, but there really does have to be a safe place to share your real self. One of the organizations we study that is not a military organization, it's a very, very large uh, tech company that no one has heard of, by the way, it's not one of the famous ones, but it's a very, very large billions of dollar tech company. They've stumbled on a really interesting approach. And what it is, is that all the way from the top of the organization, they're committed to sharing their real selves. So you have CEOs and, and people, other people in the C-suite uh, the CEO and other people in the C-suite sharing their problems they've had in life, their addictions, their um, personal issues, their everything. And they, they, they encourage that kind of real sharing of real selves all the way down in the organization. And, and, and what it's done is bring people closer together, people with illnesses or with uh, you know, problems or personal problems or financial problems, whatever it might be, are, are encouraged to help each other and recognize each other for their full humanity, all of their, you know, warts and all. And it may sound very scary and it may sound um, like something that, you know, would be uh, too risky, but actually they've, they've had incredible, they have an incredibly high satisfaction rate with jobs at that company and with the culture at the company. And then one other thing I'll say is that my, my colleague and dear friend, uh, Charles Henderson, who was at the Harvard Business School with me, we were classmates, and we're working together on these issues now. He's a former heroin addict and convicted felon. He would not mind me telling you that at all. And he, um, while he was in school, um, once was asked to, um, if because he spoke so well about the problems of addiction and spoke so eloquently, one of his classmates said, have you ever had struggles with that? And he lied and said, no, I haven't. And he said, I'll never, ever forget that the rest of his life, the feeling he had for not telling the truth about himself. And now he tells his whole full story about his background. And that's the story that he uses as a springboard to encourage in other people their vulnerability and their sharing of their real selves. And that's what a real leader does, I, I believe. That's what a real leader does. And that's how you start to make inroads to real cohesion and, and real understanding of each other across gender, you know, genders, across races, and, and where you can really develop a team and all that means. Yeah, what I what I think I hear us talking about um, in terms of this 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 kind of 
dynamic between being yourself or pretending to be someone else, be kind of able to, to, to exist in your, your true self is this, this dichotomy between assimilation and acceptance, right? And so we can create diversity, right? We can get uh, different kinds of people uh, into an organization. But if we, you know, to, to Captain Haver's earlier point, if we ask them to just assimilate, you know, and just pretend to be, you know, what everybody already is, then we really haven't moved the needle too far at all. Because diversity is only effective if we are utilizing that diversity intentionally, right? And we are utilizing the uniqueness that each person brings to the team to be better at what we're doing. So it's it's not enough to just have diverse people or increase diversity. We have to we have to do that intentionally, um, um, kind of with our mission needs and requirements um, uh, in mind there. Um, and I think we're we're to, to go back to the point about hindering, where the resistance comes is that to do that to accept people for their true selves. And, and quite honestly, it, it, it may be some of the non-diverse people that we have here too, right? That aren't fully comfortable assimilating into any given environment, right? But allowing people to, to really revel in their true selves will change the culture, right? It will change uh, what that group dynamic is. And especially when we talk in special operations at like a team level, I think that that's, that's one of those, you know, um, uh, touch points that we're going to really have to to figure out how to break through. I think that's a barrier that that still exists within the soft enterprise that we're going to figure have to figure out how to break through, um, uh, because I think there is going to be a need to to change some of those those team cultures and expand them, allow for room um, for for more people to be included, but as their true selves, right? Um, and I, and, I, and I will add to that that I think at, at the core of all this, you know, when we're talking about having conversations about diversity and respect in our organizations, what we're really looking for there, I, I think, is buy-in, right? And I think to be to facilitate diversity and inclusion efforts, we need buy-in at all levels, right? Um, not just at our senior leader, general officer, and flag officer levels. We need it at all levels, at all echelons of our organization. Um, uh, or, or it's not going to work. It'll, it'll kind of shut down wherever, <laughs> wherever, wherever that buy-in stops. And so, um, you know, that's just part of the challenge of, of, of getting to each of those levels and ensuring that the buy-in is there uh, across across the board. Colonel, I couldn't agree more. Um, we have some questions from the audience, and they're tough questions. And this is a difficult panel, so there's going to, you know, we're going to get these questions. So the first question I wanted to throw at us is this, have us um, embrace, I should say. Will D and I go beyond race and gender? What about ageism, religion, political ideology? Uh, I think what the person's getting at is, is, is everything culturally equal? Um, and I, I wonder what the panel thinks of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll step in and start on this one. I, I think the answer is yes, absolutely. And, and I want to be clear, we already have a diverse force, right? And so I, I don't want our the conversation to kind of, you know, suggest that that there is there is no diversity in, 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 in SOCOM uh, or in this organization, because there certainly is. Um, but yeah, I do think that when we talk about diversity, um, we are talking about all different kinds of diversity. Uh, I think we also have to recognize that, that we know we are, um, extremely underrepre um, underrepresented in some areas. Uh, and I think it's also fair to target those areas as we recognize those areas to be operational imperatives, as we recognize those areas to be um, necessary to maximizing our cap capability as a fighting force. Thanks for that. I mean, I think diversity does mean, you know, diversity means diversity and there has to be, a, you know, there has to be a, a recognition and a valuing of diversity in all of its forms, whether it's religious, whether it's um, sexual orientation, and, and, and Lord knows there have certainly been debates and issues around um, sexual orientation and gender identity in the military as well, which is a, a you know which is very recently um, we've seen that, um, and so I think that diversity has to be. If we mean it, we mean it. 
right? So we don't just mean it in one area, we mean it in all areas, or, or, or we really don't mean it at all, I think. But we, there is one phenomenon that's a really important thing to always consider, and that is homophily. And that all that means is that we, like to, we tend to like to be around people who are like us. And so if you the one thing you do need to recognize is that if you if you if that's true and then you have a not as diverse group or workforce then there has to be a forced effort to fight against the tendency toward homophily because then you're just going to you know you're going to hire what I call the amen choir and <laughs> hire the people who agree with you and look like you and um and you know are like you and so so I think that's a, that is one thing that is important to keep in mind, and and it might be about religion. It might be about hiring somebody with a religion that's different from yours, or someone who has no religion at all, um, and or someone with a different gender identity. And those are things that you do have to keep right in the front of your mind, particularly if you're in the majority group, because if you have a commitment to it, then you have a you have to have a commitment to you do have to have a commitment to recognizing your own biases, whoever you are. And that, and that you may be, you know, you may be have a, a different lens because of those. So I think it's important. But but to the to the direct question, it, diversity either means something or it doesn't. And if it means something, then we're talking about diversity in all respects. And I think that's one of the things that makes this country wonderful and beautiful, and, and makes the military certainly effective uh, effective uh, in in doing its mission and carrying out its mission. I think the, the last thing that I'll add is I think that the reason why that this is a topic of conversation in general is so that we can maximize all of our resources, right? Our greatest resources in military in general are, are human beings. That's what we have. Um, I, I think then, then the conversation comes into uh, the right person for the right job, and that doesn't have a face uh, necessarily. That has to do with values. That has to do with capabilities. Um, that has to do with, with competencies and those things can also be trained. So can that, you know, can the right person for the job sometimes be, um, you know, uh, desperate in, in, in age range, you know, older or younger? Yes. Could it sometimes be a girl or a guy? Yes. Could it sometimes be um, black or white? Yes. So I think in general, it's the right person for the right job. And that diversity that we're talking about includes everything. Thank you. That, that's, this is great discussion. Um, let's look at another question from the audience. What do you see as the biggest roadblocks to diversity and inclusion in soft and how, how to improve inclusion while continuing to focus on the mission and maintain required operational bandwidth? And anybody want to jump on that one? I guess I can, I'll start off by just saying that, um, Eventually, it shouldn't take up operational bandwidth uh, to, to include someone new on your team. It should be, it should be normal. Um, does it take time and effort to get to know somebody and, and build a relationship with them and maximize their um, efficiencies? Absolutely. Do we get it right all the time in the current environment that we're in? No, because not all leaders are equipped and built the same way. My strengths aren't the same strengths as the company commander that will come in after me, nor his weaknesses or my weaknesses. So it's changing. It's always changing. But I think what I hope in this environment that it eventually gets to is that it's it's no longer um, the topic of conversation it, um, in and of itself. It just it is it, in a, it is itself is the inclusion. It's included in our operational framework. We just value individuals, and so we don't have to necessarily make it a big deal. Until we get to that point, yeah, we probably do need to keep having those conversations. Um, what does that look like? Uh, you know, some ideas that I have right now are like we, we have equal opportunity. It is an entire you know uh, a portion of, of what we talk about. Are we talking about the right things um, in those types of you know right now? 350-1, you know, the Army specifically lays out what are our annual training requirements. Does it have to fit in a book? Are we having a conversation, you know, at, at the right level, small group conversations down to the right levels? Um, is that going to take, you know, um, dedicated time? Maybe sometimes, but are we having the conversations while you're riding in a Humvee with, you know, someone that's not like you and asking questions, building that relationship in that way? So it doesn't have to necessarily be um, specific training, maybe now. But eventually, I think that it just really becomes part of our culture and our nature. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that. I think one of our challenges is certainly attracting diverse talent. 
Um, and and I think you know to I I love that the homophily um, uh, uh, vocabulary word that I learned today. Um, but but I uh, I think I think some of that is certainly at work, right? Where we where we have recruited, where we are comfortable recruiting, um, and and recognizing that that SOCOM doesn't have recruiting authorities, and we certainly rely on the services to help us with that. But we are partnering with those ser the services um, to do that work. And so you know um, expanding our aperture, right? Expanding where we recruit recruit and more intentionally um, recruiting diverse talent, I think is a first start. And, and we've started this in lots of different ways. And this is both on the military and civilian side, you know, as we go and recruit STEM talent um, uh, uh, through different um, programs that exist in, in, in MIT, um, at Carnegie Mellon, um, looking at um, minority serving institutions um, to partner with them on recruiting um, STEM talent on, on, in the civilian sector, but then also um, looking at how we recruit diverse talent um, for our, our, our operational career fields as well. Um, and so I know as a, for instance, uh, the Naval Special Warfare is, is doing this work right now. Um, and they're looking at how they can go where diversity lives uh, and recruit diverse talent, do these kind of combines where they can um, uh, where they can both kind of measure physical fitness, but also these other key attributes that we need in soft. We need grit, we need resiliency, we need problem solving, all of these things. Um, uh, and just expanding their aperture on where they are recruiting talent, uh, I think is one of the first steps that, that we can take to, to, to um, increase diversity in our soft force. Just to that point um, about going where diversity lives, um, there's a, it's also very important, um, you know, what are we talking about to take a step back when we talk about DEI? It's diversity and representation, equity and opportunity, and inclusion and participation. So if you go to the first one, diversity and representation, you do need to have some creative ways of trying to attract those candidates and attract those, um, you know, people who would be very, individuals who'd be very interested in this work, but maybe haven't been asked and haven't been found. But you also have to have recruiting strategies that get them mentally to the bridge. You know, so if, if, if you have people who are nothing like them and have nothing in common with them and nor particularly are able to understand, you know, where they come from, what their background is and all the different varied backgrounds that recruits would come from, they're gonna see it as a bridge too far. But if you can bridge that bridge with some of the richness and diversity you already have in your in your force in your workforce to to attract the the the, um, the the different you know the range of different individuals, then they'll say, you know what, I can see myself there. That's the diversity and representation. I can now see myself there. I see her there, or I see him there, so I can see myself there. And then there has to be opportunity for, um, like happened with both of, of you uh, women and, and, and with, with Captain uh, uh, Haver in her position now, there has to be this equity of opportunity, this possibility to realize your full potential and to rise to your maximum you know, level, and then full participation and inclusion in the participation once you get there. So there's a, it's a whole range, but it has to start with getting the people in the door and having some of the, this widening of the aperture, like you say, and going where where it where people live because you can't the same old same old is not going to get us there. It's just not. Um, so I think that's important. Here's a question regarding the same old same old. Um, is DNI a new form of affirmative action? And given that the courts have ruled against quotas as detrimental to the foundations of a meritocracy, how do we deal with it? Um, there's a myth of meritocracy, and I want to say that very clearly. Um, meritocracy uh, has a lot of has a lot of baggage on it, and I don't want to uh, send us down too far of a rabbit hole. Um, but when when uh, sometimes meritocracy is used as a throwaway uh, buzzword, and um, and you got to be you got to look at what it means, and you got to look at where it comes from, and look at what the criteria are and what the metrics are to measure you know, meritocracy and what the preconceived notions are of what it means. So I would just like to get that out there. And I, I have a feeling my other panelists might have something to say about that. Um, and then uh, affirmative action, uh, when you, let's, uh, let's put it this way. Um, you know, one time, a long time ago, a mentor of mine said uh, that whatever person so-and-so was born on third base and think they hit a triple. And uh, and so some I do think some people are born on a born on a little bit farther base from where they come from 
Um, and do we want do we want meritocracy and a lack of quotas or affirmative action to mean people who were um, so that people with with you know educated parents raised in a wealthier background or who have you know had many advantages in terms of race, gender, whatever the case might be. I don't want to you know define that too narrowly. Do we want you know those people to just keep getting ahead because of all those advantages, or do we want the kind of representation from you know less privileged backgrounds of of females of you know minorities of people of different religious faith and and do we want do we want to have a broad range of representation that really represents our whole society? So I guess that's that's what I would say about that question. That's great. Yeah, I would just add to that to say, you know, no, this is this is not a, a, an affirmative action program. Um, although I, I I think that's that's you know worth a longer conversation about about why that's often offered in a negative context. Um, you know, I I, I do think in in uh, I think what what uh, the work that Jason Lyle did is really important to the conversation that we're having here in the command, right? Which is that, um, you know, in his his book, uh, work, book Divided Armies, what, what they concluded in this, this extensive study is that more inclusive and more diverse armies perform better throughout history throughout time, right? And so we're not we're not saying that we need to increase the diversity of our force or create more inclusive environments just because it's a buzzword or or just because it's the topic of the day. We're saying that we need to do it because it is an operational imperative because we are a more capable force if we do those things and we use that diversity intentionally to get after the mission uh, that we're doing globally right um and so i th i think we we need to not lose sight of of that part of it and i and, and so here's what i will say to that i think you know i i i I talk about where we are in terms of this effort as, you know, we're just leaving infancy, infancy and we're kind of trying to get to toddlerhood here, right? <laughs> right? We're at the very kind of beginnings of, of, of our diversity and inclusion efforts in the, in the command here. And as we do more work, um, as, as Jason suggested here, um, to figure out how much diversity matters and, and where specifically this diversity and inclusion is, is necessary to furthering our mission objectives, to being a more capable force. I think we will, we'll, you know, we're gonna tease more of that out as we continue through this effort. Um, but I think we, we, we have at least recognized that, that those, that's a true statement and, and that we need to put that work in um, uh, to get there. Thanks, Colonel. Captain, did you want to jump in? I'll just say, you know, to add on to Colonel Pipes, um, an aspect of, you know, the diversity too then is um, this idea of resilience. Um, and we can build off of people's experiences. Like organizations have the ability, obviously, to um, the human organization based off of people's experience to be able to rebound um, through different things to be um, adaptable. Um, again, you know, I might not have the same strengths uh, or weaknesses or experiences that somebody else has. Uh, and, and that can come from anybody. So um, I know I've probably said it a couple times and I'll say it a couple times again before the, the panel's over, but having the right people and the right jobs, having the opportunity for the amount, most amount of experience in the room um, to be able to share in that, it, it is the whole reason why this is important, um, that we're not excluding, you know, another half of our society just, just because. So we want to, we want to recruit them. We want to tell them and show them that they can. Um, I have been super grateful for the opportunities that I have had because I didn't get to watch somebody else do it um, necessarily before me, maybe in a different way. Um, and there are, gen there are there are generally some women out there specifically, you know, like I can look at Colonel Pipes right now and say, she's a Colonel, awesome, I can, I can go and do that. I can sit on a, a J1 staff and my voice matters. I have a seat at the table, I can do that. Um, but at the, the tactical maneuver right now, I have, I have team leaders, I have squad leaders, I have, you know, NCOs um, that are coming up to the ranks that are that are seeing this and maybe where they have some insecurities or maybe where they feel as though they haven't exactly been developed. Again, just like uh, Dr. Hermeling says, like I, I see that happening and I feel like I can maybe walk into more of my potential because I see that. So um, I'll just I'll kind of leave it at that one. That's outstanding. Uh, good insight. Um, let me ask a question. There, are, I'm an ally but not all these questions are coming from allies. So let me put it that way. Um, here's one that I think is, says we've been talking on this for 30 years 
in, in that this person's been in the business. And these issues are cyclical. How do we break the cycle? How do we actually get ahead and make some real progress? Uh, okay, I'll go. I'll go, and then Dr. Hamley, I'll, I'll I'll let you take this. But I, but I, look. I think it's, I think it's um, the frustration behind that question. That question is 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 well earned, right? Uh, and and as someone who has been in the military for for nearly twenty three years, working these. Um, uh, conversations, I, I'm, I'm, I feel the same way, right? And, and I, and I do think when we talk about hindrances to diversity and inclusion, there gets to be a point where we, uh, in an organization and as part of an organizational culture, have to, to call out willful, willful ignorance, um, you know, when we see it, right? So, so we have a responsibility to educate and train, and, that, and that's one of our lines of effort here in our effort. Um, but, but there's also a responsibility on each of our teammates to to um, be present um, and open to that training and education um, and to do some of that work, right? And, and it does get to a point where, um, if as you've been through this cycle several times, you know, where we have to ask, is this willful ignorance? And, and if so, does it start to go into that resistant, that kind of passive resistance that I, that I mentioned before? And, and I think it's a fair question to ask, right? Um, I, I also think it's fair uh, uh, and I and I have a, a kind of op-ed in the, the Air Force Times that talks a little bit about this in terms of uh, addressing the Air Force's racial disparity, um, but it can be very frustrating to just reside in this conversation space, right? And 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 uh, and want to get to action, and and we do have a responsibility to ensure that we do take action. And so I also recognize that our our DNI strategy is just that; it's a strategy, and it, and it does reside in this kind of conversational space. And so our next steps our implementation and, and our, our next actual step is an action plan, right? And that's the work that we're doing right now so that we can ensure a sustained effort that continues the conversation. The conversation is important and we need to keep having it, but we also do need to take action and, and we have a responsibility and should be held accountable for demonstrating that we have taken action. Well, action is rewarded uh... Or, or penalized by through incentives. And so if it comes from the top, if, if, if from the very top leadership, whether it's in a, in a particular group or battalion, or whether it's at the highest levels of military leadership or the leadership of any organization, if, if that person or people are bought in and they really want to do this and they really want to make a commitment to it, then they need to incentivize it. They need to continuously check up on it. They need to foster it. And, and really reward you know, the, the behavior and the actions that are going to lead toward not just window dressing and not just you know, you know, talking the talk, but really walking the walk. And if you don't do that, and if there isn't buy-in from the, from the top and there isn't real leadership, it will just be this recurring cycle of grievance and discussion and, and whatnot. It's never gonna change. And then the con to the point about conversation, you know, it's important, I think, to try to, uh, maybe I'm a Pollyanna, but to try to see the best in other people until you're proven otherwise. And so I think if you have a, if you can have real honest discussions, I've got a very, very close friend who's a, an older white male who feels uh, very much aggrieved and blamed for being who he is. And addressing him and his, and, and I understand some of where he's coming from, and, and he doesn't want to, he says he's not privileged and he has struggled in his life and had to work for what he's gotten and some of the, the kinds of messages that he hears, and he's not in the military, he's in a different type of organization, but the messages that he hears make him feel attacked and aggrieved. And until we can have really honest conversations and really understand what's underneath you know, the layers and really get it out there. There's always going to be this kind of elephant in the room, and there's going to be these really difficult things. And you know, you know, take the risk of trying to be honest and 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 forthright and understand each other, and then encourage those kinds of risks and encourage that kind of behavior right from the top. Or, or thank you for that. Um, I think this question is in line with the, some of the th thoughts of that individual who you mentioned. He, this question is, as society becomes more progressive, how do we keep from disenfranchising white males?
anybody? <laughs> what is it? I guess so. I mean, from from the perspective that we're talking about, you know, um, from the military perspective, I think that it's that relationship piece again. To how can you hate somebody um, if you don't know them uh, from either from either side? You know, uh, you you absolutely can't. That's that's why we have the problems that we do. How do you solve that? Then then you ask them the question. Hey, who are you? Um, how, how do I how do I get to know you better? How do I get to understand um, your situation better um, in general? Because a lot of issues or differences that people have really don't have very much to do with their their gender or ethnicity or religion. Maybe sometimes they do, but really usually it just has to do with uh, ha having a conversation and having a relationship with somebody. Um, so I I think from from that perspective, you know, how do you how do you keep it all inclusive and not excluding men? Um, believe me, my, my, the formations that I lead, um, are the majority, uh, right now, especially where I'm at, um, white males. Uh, I, I absolutely feel ownership and responsibility for them. Uh, I, I love my soldiers. I treat them all, um, the same. Sometimes it's equally being disciplined and sometimes it's e equally being celebrated. Um, and that's gotta be, that's gotta be intentional, um, and not marginalizing either. Um, women can be right um, about what they're they're trying to express about, like, hey, I'm getting left out or whatever. But we can also be loud at the top of or wrong at the top of our voices um, when we start to um, be included at the exclusion of someone else. Then that's that's not inclusion. Um, and what I what I hope that I continue to show from my position is I'm not trying to marginalize anyone else. I'm just trying to also do outstanding. That's very articulate. Yeah, no, I think that's a great response. And, you know, I I paused on that question because, um, you know, I, I think there are some some assumptions behind that question um, th that I think deserve challenging a, a bit, right? And and so, you know, when we think about disadvantaging, what, I, I'll think about it this way, right? When when I think about the eligible population for, for service, for, for the military, right? When we talk about fitness, when we talk about mental health, when we talk about, you know, meeting educational requirements and, and those things, nearly half, and it might be over half now, it might be more towards 51% of that eligible population are women, right? Um, and so, so, I, I understand where that question is coming from, but I also think it's fair to recognize that that we are kind of so far away from disenfranchising, you know, uh, uh, you know, the dominant group right now uh, that that's worthy of consideration. Um, and and I, you know, Isabel Isabel Wilkerson in her book Cast talks about that argument um, much more articulately than I'm going to be able to hear, but it's worth looking at her argument there in terms of like how many hundreds of years we might get to, <laughs> to really to really kind of meet the intent behind, uh, you know, some of the assumptions I think that are behind that, that question. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so and, I, and I'm often challenging our, our leadership too when we talk about wanting to kind of represent the, the republic that we serve that, that hey, let, let's, let's be clear that that means that we would be half women. Right, uh, like that—that—that's that, that, half of our eligible population here, and so, so you know, we need to also encourage those conversations as we move forward. Can, can I uh, give a sh another shout out to the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, one of the best, truly one of the best books I've ever read uh, in my life, um, and what well, wonderful book! And uh, there, there is an idea in that book that this is in the water and in the air and the assumptions we have about who's in charge and who's not are, are we, we live and breathe it and we have, you know, lived and breathed it for a very long time. And so to question some of those assumptions takes a very long time. And I think of the question, I believe, used the word progressive as society becomes more progressive. And progressive is a loaded word um, about what you know what that word means. It has political implications. It has an idea of progress toward something new or maybe something better. But when things change, there can be resistance to change. To use the, the R word that uh, Colonel Pipes used earlier, and so I think that it's important to, to, to look at if you look at evolutionary biology, talent, skill, intelligence are across races and across gender and across gender identity, there is no, there is no superior anything by, by fiat or by, by, by definition. There, there's, a, there's a, you know, a general you know, distribution, there's an equal distribution of talents and skills and, 
and, and whatnot across, uh, across genders, races, et cetera. So if you believe that, and then you say that half the society is women, and then you look at the, all the different groups and all the different ethnicities and minor, you know, uh, races and, and, and religions that we come from, you, you want to see the talent in all, across all these uh, groups rise to the top and be utilized to its full potential. So, um, you know, I think we're far from, um, I think we're far from uh, having achieved that. Let me just say that. Uh, and, and, and we're progressing toward hopefully achieving that, to use the word progressive. Excellent. Thank you. All great responses. And I think we have a very good conversation going. Um, but I wanted to bring something up for Captain Haver. In the studies I've I've done and the things I've read about small group cohesion and small unit co small units and how they function in battle, it's it's kind of the, the brotherhood, right? How did how do you fit into that? And how how have you have you found that an obstacle, or have they have men been receptive to you joining that quote unquote brotherhood? And is there something broader than that? Sure. Um, so I'm sure there is something broader to that, but but I think I kind of mentioned it at the beginning of um, our, our panel here um, that I have had the opportunity, right, to be part of these small groups as I've gone through. And regardless of maybe a bias that maybe I had or someone in the group had before me coming in, um, I have chosen to walk like walk into that space and to have have those conversations. Um, I can bet you a billion dollars, um, that I haven't walked away, you know, changing every single person, you know, that I've encountered their mind, but I do operate personally wanting to, you know, leave the best impression of the best leadership, my character and my values. Um, when I leave uh, a place, it's part of the fact that I'm an officer and a leader. It has to do with just my personality and, and what I believe in, um, and it, I think it shows and manifests itself mostly like in the way that I, that I treat people. So um, again, people want to know what your intentions are. They're going to sniff you out at the beginning and try to understand why you're there. Um, there, there absolutely will be people there for the wrong reasons. And that's men, women, whoever, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, so I think that the encouragement that I can give here is uh, to both sides of the fence is to give each person that opportunity to show their true colors. If at the end of the day, um, I've encountered someone, you know, that has deemed me, you know, not worthy of their respect, that's their opinion, that's, that's their prerogative. Um, but if I've walked away leaving a, a better, you know, respect and responsibility uh, for the other male cohort, cohorts um, or, or bringing up, you know, junior female leaders behind me, um, based off of my personal example, um, that's all I can do. I can't, I can't sit there and tell the successes of anybody um, around me, except for what, what I'm doing currently. So it's, it's a, it's a do, do as I do, not as I say, right. We, we, we say that as leaders, but you have to actually be in that situation in order to judge it. Uh, and, and I encourage my supporters to do that often. A lot of people who have negative opinions will be because they, they chose not to know. They don't want to ask the question. They don't want to change their mind. I most recently just read a book by Adam Grant, Think Again, and it blew my mind in general about changing your mind and that not being a bad thing, it being something that you should um, embrace and something about learning something new. And if you can change your mind about uh, the way that you see yourself being wrong, then maybe it's not, maybe it's not going to be so, you know, like gut wrenching to be like, oh, I've always never thought women should be in this job, like rip my heart out. Like, wow, uh, this this lady that I worked with in the 82nd Airborne Division, she changed my mind and that's pretty awesome. And then the next person after that, they get to change your mind all over again because maybe they're good, maybe they aren't. So I think that it's just, it's really important to take each person as they are. It's a, it's a big conversation, right? We have to give people the opportunity. You gotta give somebody the opportunity to either walk in to that position, walk into that space and crush it uh, to lead the way, to do the right things, to be a good leader, uh, to be a good follower, male, women, it doesn't matter, right? You're saying the right person for the right job or give them the opportunity to show you that they're not the right person for the job. And then it doesn't have to be about gender anymore. That's what we're going for, right? Is when gender is not even an issue anymore. 
that's that's great. I appreciate your comments. Well, we're running out of time, um, but we do have a few few minutes left. So I thought I'd go around the room and we can kind of say our last parting thoughts. So um, Colonel Pipes, hand it over to you. No, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. This was a wonderful conversation, um, and it, it, it's it's great to talk with uh, these two women about this issue. And uh, and I appreciate the the questions, um, and especially the tough questions. I think I think we need to continue to engage on this issue uh, and be open to to having dialogue um, with those tough questions. Um, and so, you know, I, I look forward to continuing these conversations and and especially leveraging um, the Joint Special Operations University. Um, to do that. Excellent. And we, we hope to play a role in that as well. Dr. Harmeling? I'd like to end with the thought of giving each other a little bit of a break. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, trying to maybe not be knee jerk, too sensitive on any side about anything and try to say, you know, try to take a step back and, and maybe, maybe understand that people don't have bad intentions when they're trying to interact with you and maybe through dialogue you can understand them but i think one way to get to a higher plane is to all the way around give each other a little bit of a break and uh and and communicate and communicate as well as we can with each other and i too have had a wonderful time talking to these uh two accomplished women and to you uh, the very able facilitator of our discussion today and, uh, and so thank you so much for this opportunity. And I hope to continue the discussion of uh, DEI and ethics um, in the military because it's a truly fascinating forum for it. Thank you for that compliment. I appreciate it. And Captain Haver, did you want to have the last word? Yeah, I guess so. I think you should have the last word, but uh, <laughs> just like everyone else, I'll echo. It's been, it's been really awesome getting to know these ladies. Um, I definitely, um, have learned a lot from both of you, whether it's from you know the academia side or the policy side. Definitely something that um, I, I, I personally can use and move forward. Uh, when we met each other uh, the other day, I, I got to tell you just, hey, I've, I've been doing the thing, so I, I don't know, even know if I'm doing it right or wrong. And I've been so grateful that my leaders have allowed me to do that um, and, and to walk, um, you know, walk my leadership road, um, regardless of where it leads me. Um, but it, it's when I have opportunities like this to kind of see on the outside, like outside of my treasury a little bit sometimes of making mistakes and learning from them uh, that, I, that I see that, that I'm so grateful that the conversations are being had by perfect, perfectly capable people like you and educating us in the right ways to move the bowl down, down the road. So we don't have to keep repeating history, right? We can make it, we can change it. Standing. Thank you to all of you. Uh, this has been a great panel. We're finishing a minute or two early, so we might have a, a little break here, um, but I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Joe Long if he's there. If not, just hold on and, and we'll, we'll be back. Thank you. Thank you also very much for a fascinating discussion. Uh, on a personal note, that was exactly what I had hoped would happen, where we could really take a sincere dive into some of these issues. Um, that, are, that are very complex and sometimes they're, they're difficult topics to, to discuss and to present on. So thank you all very much. Uh, the, the perspectives and experience discussed in all of our panels have truly made this an exciting and unique educational experience. Uh, please do not forget that we also have our rapporteur team that's energetically observing these, uh, these panels and taking critical notes in order to function as the necessary and critical feedback loop for ensuring that the knowledge uncovered in the last two days becomes part of the JSAL educational process. Thank you all for your hard work and for making sure that JSAL remains able to produce and present timely, innovative, and relevant classes. Mm -hmm.